You're loving Jesus tonight. You still awake tonight? <laughs> a little bit. That's all right. I always tell people, I mean, one of my friends put up on his church thing. He said, come to church, best weekend in town. So, <laughs> I heard him preach. I agree with him. Uh, <laughs> so, How many of you know that, you know, we're in an interesting time frame? <laughs> it is definitely interesting. About six years ago, November, the Lord began to speak to me that we had a seven-year window of opportunity. And if we didn't take advantage of this, the church world would be closed at least for a season. Uh, about three weeks ago, the Lord spent the night with me, literally talking to me again, reminding me that the next 13 months is, is crucial for what needs to be done in this nation. It's very, very crucial because we're, we're, at, we're at a turning point. We go either direction. That's true. You know, we're just at a turning point. And... And if the church doesn't wake up, you know, America as we know it will be gone. So it's time that we understand that it's time for us to wake up. And uh, I was listening to Bill Johnson recently, and he made, he made this statement because I've seen it all around the country. I travel so much. And he said, he said, America is in a weariness epidemic. And I believe that. Because literally, if you're tired, you can go to bed and basically wake up refreshed. But if you're weary, there's only one way to get rid of weariness, and that's to come to Jesus. That's where it says Matthew eleven twenty eight: 28. All of you that are weary and heavy laden, come unto me, I'll give you rest. And to be honest with you, we need to come to Him because until you give God, once you access God, God will access your problems. Come on. But it's your responsibility is to access Him. And I believe that honestly we renew our strength just by being in His presence. That's why a lot of times you know, people don't understand the corporate anointing is so important for removing weariness. So important for removing weariness. Okay. You know, you, uh, you can watch online and get something. But when you're in the live atmosphere, come on. Yeah. You know, Jay, the Bible didn't say, you know, you just watch online and it says, you know, don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together. Right. Which means we got to come together. Right. Come on. And it's time that we, we come together around the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I ask God, you know, I ask God for a word for this year, and I, I, I'm still on it. He gave me one, he gave me the word uncaged. He said, the church has been caged for too long. You know, 2 Kings 6 1 says, Christ, your living is too limited for you. In Malachi 4, it talks about like we'd be like calves released from a stall. You know, how many of you understand that, you know, when we we live in self-imposed limitations? Come on. Because with God, nothing's impossible. There is no lid. It's a question, according to your faith, so be it. But so many people, they're, they're basically stuck in a rut. And the rut used to be a full of life, but now it's just a rut. And God's trying to wake us up to believe for more. You know, one of my favorite sayings is basically, I have not come this far to come to only come this far. You know, because there's more with God, there's more than anything else. And I asked God, I said, God, how do we get uncaged? How do we how do we get rid of the weariness? And and the Lord told me, He He, he began to speak to me 
about how the church needs an oil change. <laughs> Come on. You know, that literally the joy is our strength. And until the church gets happy, we'll never have revival. Well, true. Because who would want what we have if we're all miserable? Come on. You know, some of the worst witnesses there are are Christians. Because if I, I hang around them long enough, I get sad. Come on. There are a lot of people I know who are Sadducees. I'm a glad you see. Come on. We got a happy pappy. See, all throughout Scripture, the kingdom of life is one of joy. It's righteousness. Peace and joy, Romans 14, 17, in the Holy Spirit. That's kingdom life. You know, Psalm 87, verse 7 says, All my springs of joy are in you. All my springs of joy are in you. It talks about drawing joy from the well of salvation. Jesus, it was so important to him when he talked about abiding in the vine. And, and if we abide in him, his word abides in us, we can ask whatever we will, we shall be done. It goes on to say, I have written, the, I have spoken these things to you so that your joy would be made full. Come on. In John 16, 23 and 24, it says, Until now you've asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy will be made full. Yeah. See, so, well, I found out that I have people say, well, you can be joyful, you just don't have to be happy. <laughs> That's the stupidest thing. Yeah. You know, religious people are dumb. <laughs> I'm sorry, you know. It is. You know, it's the dumbest thing I've ever seen, you know. You know, well. How many of you understand to rejoice in the command? That's right. Yeah. Rejoice in the Lord always. Yeah. Again, I mean, just in case you didn't get the first time. Again, I say rejoice. Yeah. Rejoice evermore, not nevermore. Come on, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. See, there's something about the joy that is contagious. That's right. And that's why God wants us to enter the kingdom as like a little kid. How many of you, how many of you have been around little kids? I, I love them. I, I, we have... In our family, we now have nine that are eight and under. And I love the giggles. I love the giggles. Come on. There's nothing like the giggles of kids. That's right. And to be honest with you, had, had we not grown up, we'd be giggling too. That's why I'd rather be around kids than grown-ups. Because kids are fun. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I understand why they say grumpy old man, too. <laughs> Let's go to Isaiah 61. I'm going to have some fun today. I, I, I'm going to have enough fun for all of you. <laughs> because to be honest with you, like I said, you know, if we don't have the best party in town, they won't come. They won't. I mean, if we honestly believe what we, we, we say we believe, we should be rejoicing all the time. We rejoice in the good times, we rejoice in the bad times. We, we'd be like Job, we'd laugh at calamity. That's what it says in Job. I will yet laugh at calamity. <laughs> he had just been having his kids killed and all the losing everything. He's still laughing. And later on, Job says, God will yet fill the man of integrity's mouth with laughter. There's something about joy, unspeakable, and full of glory. Isaiah 61 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God's upon me, because he God, the Lord has anointed me to bring good news. See, he didn't bring me, he didn't say just bring news, bring good news. So, I, you know, I don't watch a whole lot of news. Why? It's not good. <laughs> half of it's fake, yeah, and then the other half that's not even fake is not all that good. <laughs> so, you know, he's anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. 
to proclaim the favor of the year of the Lord, to comfort the, the, uh, the in the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning. Come on. And it says the man will praise instead of the spirit of faint, and then they'll be called the oaks of righteousness, the plain of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Then, what, when? After they all change, they're going to rebuild the ancient ruins. They'll raise up the former devastations. They'll repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Strangers will come and pasture your, your, your flocks, and foreigners will be your farmers and your vine dressers. But you'll be called priests of the Lord. You'll be spoken of as ministers of our God. You'll eat the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you'll have a double portion. Instead of humiliation, they'll shout for joy over their portion. Therefore, they will possess a double portion in the land. See, I asked him, you know, God, I said, God, what locks the joy? And he says, shame. Shame. You know, if Jesus was here, and he is in me, but if he was here physically, he'd go to every one of you and say, shame off you. Shame off you. Because he came to take the shame off of you. Come on. You know, most of us have word curses spoken over us. Over the years, shame on you. Shame on you. And yet God wants to take the shame off of us. Right. And there's three areas of shame. There's the shame of not being enough. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, you'll never be good enough in your own. Period. You'll never be good enough. <clears throat> but you're already accepted. You know, I always used to say about my son, my son to me has always been perfect. And yet I spent most of his early years correcting his imperfections. And yet when I looked at him, he was perfect. Because he was mine. I was looking at the potential and correcting anything that was going to make him not live up to his potential. Come on. Is that what God continues to do with us? We shouldn't have shame of not being enough. You're already accepted in the beloved. Come on. You're already loved. There's a shame of not doing enough. And be honest with you, you can get so caught up in works, you know, I don't pray enough, I don't do that. I mean, how many of you know, if you have to earn it, you're in trouble. That's right. You have to earn it. Yeah. See, everything in, this, in the Christian life is inheritance. Right. You didn't earn it, it was freely given you. Okay. Come on. That doesn't mean you don't pray, it just means, you, guess what, you'll never, you'll never pray enough. You never read the Bible enough. In fact, uh, you'll never do anything enough. It's not about doing, it's about relating. It's about walking with God. That's where freedom is. Yeah. And then, then, then there's the shame of not having enough. A lot of people, they, you know, they, 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 they feel the pressure and everything else. Well, if, you, if you're living under that type of shame, you can't, it's hard to have joy. It will quench the joy. God wants to lift it off you. I think people are saying, you get around God, you know what he does? He literally takes off of you everything that's not of him. The anointing destroys yokes, removes burdens. So literally God unloads you so he can load you down with benefits. So literally he unloads you and then he loads you so you can get loaded. You can say, I, got to, I go to church get loaded. Come on now. I just go to church and get loaded. Sometimes you go to church and get unloaded first. But you know, I get to church and get loaded. <laughs> I used to go other places and get loaded. <laughs> and now I go to church and get loaded. But I get the most high here. Come on. You know, Joel 2 talks about, talks about God is going to make up for all the wasted years. In Joel 2.25. We're about to get some makeup time. Yeah. Come on. That's right. Makeup time. All the wasted years. You know what it says at the very end of that passage? I believe in verse 27, 28, right in a row, or 26 and 27, it says, And my people will never be put to shame. 
My people will never be put to shame. Come on. Let me understand, the whole world is looking for happiness. They are. They're, look, they're looking for it. They're, look, they're looking for people that actually seem to be happy, genuinely happy. Psalm 126 says this. See, this is where I know scripturally that, that the greatest tool of evangelism is joy. It says when God turns the captivity of Zion, we're like those who dream again. And God will fill our mouth with laughter. Come on. Yeah. And our tongue with joyful shouting. It says, then the heathen will say. Then the heathen will say. That's revival, man. When the heathen are saying, hey, the Lord's done great things for you. The heathen will say, the Lord, what caused the heathen to say it? The joy. Amen. I go into my bank. You know what they say? Here comes the happy preacher. <laughs> now, you understand. My bank has hundreds of preachers. It's a big bank. But I'm the happy one. Here comes the happy preacher. You know, I, I tell, I, I'll tell anybody this. If it's not fun, I ain't doing it. <laughs> I don't care. If I do a funeral, I'm going to roast the guy. I'm going to have fun. <laughs> What's he going to do? He gonna, if he gets up, hey, it's a miracle. Maybe if I offend him enough, he'll get up. No. <laughs> I, I literally have a list of people who want me to do their funerals. They say, your feelings are so much fun. I tell every funny story you can tell in church. Every funny story you can tell in church. <laughs> Come on. He said, why? Because joy is, the joy is medicine. Come on. It's good medicine. It do good like a medicine. The reason why everyone is so sick is they're all stressed out because they're not laughing enough. Come on. I work with cancer patients all over the country. In fact, many of us, we, we've had so many documented cancer healings in our ministry. You know, I, I have a couple written up in Harvard Medical books. I have, I've actually lectured in, in Buffalo at their hospital, their cancer research hospital. We've had, you know, a few years ago, we had four stage four cancer people healed in one meeting. There, five years later, still cancer free. You know. But, you know, in fact, this, this last year, we had prayed for a young man. Three major cancerous tumors. They gave, him, they gave him a few weeks to live. Prayed for him. They opened him up to take the tumors out. Every tumor was totally encapsulated. The cancer was still there, but it was totally encapsulated. So it had, couldn't spread. Yeah, but three of them. The doctor said they had never seen three of them. They've seen one. But they never saw three like that spread. And there were still a couple little specks left that they were treating. But it, the diagnosis is, hey, so you don't live a long life. You know, I love that stuff. But you know, you know what they do in a lot of these cancer research centers? They have a laugh room. It's actually in hospitals now where they have terminally ill people and they go and just play comedies all the time, getting people laughing, and they've seen some miraculous recoveries. Come on. Some of you should try it. Not because you're sick, but because your soul is sick. Come on, if you're not laughing a lot, your soul is sick. Is this okay? Come on, somebody. See, I, I, I don't know about you. I know God has a good sense of humor. Look at the right, you look at the left, and you look in the mirror. You're all funny. Yeah. I remember years ago, I was at Disney World. And how many of you are people watchers? I love to watch people. It's like one of my hobbies. Which means all I have to do is go to Walmart. <laughs> you know? It is, man. I've never seen styles like that before. <laughs> Hopefully, some of them I can't get out of my mind, and that's really sad. I mean, healing of the memories. <laughs> but I love I love Walmart and I love airports because you have all the cultures at airports, and I love going to airports with my son because he speaks nine languages. 
So I can listen in on all these conversations. <laughs> I remember we staying at the airport one time, this guy, these people are talking Mandarin Chinese, I don't know what they're doing, all of a sudden, Joy starts laughing, he said, dang, that was funny, all these Chinese are laughing too. I said, what was it? He said, I can't tell you, you're a preacher. <laughs> but it was funny. <laughs> well, I, I remember I took my son to Disney World. There's actually some type of meaning to this. But I took my son <laughs> to Disney World, and you know, I didn't even have to listen in the conversation because this guy was so mad, and I almost fell off laughing. I'm sorry. I thought, He's yelling at his kids. His kids are crying. He had three young kids. And this is what he said. And he's screaming at them. You will be happy. <laughs> you will be happy. I spent way too much money for you not to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard God say, now you know how I feel. <laughs> I became a curse with your curse. Come on. I bore your sin. I bore your disease. I bore all the oppression and all the penalty. Everything was laid on me on Calvary. I paid way too good, too big a price for you not to be happy. Come on. Does this make sense to you? See, what I found out is if you're going to if you're going to draw people, it's going to be joy that's going to draw them. Not going to be sadness. You know, I always have to tell my worship team, chill out. I say, we're here to celebrate. I love when I did international things with my son because my son would do all these international competitions. I always sat in the Brazilian, not the American section. I always sat in the Brazilian section because they were the best partiers. <laughs> I mean, all, the, all these other people, I mean, they're all science nerds. I don't care, Brazilian nerds are fun. <laughs> they're dancing, woo, woo, woo. That's, hey, that's my group. <laughs> you know, people get around me saying, you can't be a preacher. I said, why? Because you're fun. <laughs> and isn't that sad? Isn't it sad the way the world looks at it? No one wants to go to church because they had enough depression. <laughs> we should be the good news. We should be the See, I'm going to tell you something. You'll either live upbeat or you'll live beat up. Yep. Think about that. That choice is yours. See, God sits in heaven and laughs. Psalm 2, 4. In the heathen rage. And yet so many times the church is more like heathen than heaven. You know, you might as well start laughing now. You're going to have the last laugh. You know, C.S. Lewis says, joy is the serious business of heaven. I like that. Joy is the serious business of heaven. Some of us said, can't you ever get serious? I said, yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm doing the serious business of heaven. <laughs> you know, it is. The joy is our strength. You know, it, it's amazing. It, the primary fuel for your emotional tank is joy. And if you have no joy, there's a leak somewhere in your Christianity. Yep. It's just the way it is. I don't know about you. You know, I remember years ago, it, I knew exactly what year. It was 1989. 1989, I rented out, New Year's Eve, 1989, I rented out the largest ballroom in Portland, Maine. And I said, we're going to throw the biggest party in town. The world has their New Year's Eve party. The church is going to have a New Year's Eve party. So I called all my churches together. And we, we had made five, 700 people there that night. And we, I told them, I said, it's going to get wild. We're going, to, we're going to be dancing on the tables. You get to my age now, you kind of tap your toes. But same thing. I start dancing on the inside. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> but back in those days, I mean, we were wild, man. We didn't have any alcohol. We didn't have any drugs. All we had was the most high and new wine. Amen. Come on. And we are just rejoicing and having so much fun. And right next to us is the ballroom that has soldiers about ready to be deployed to Afghanistan. And their party wasn't done. So they came from their party because they're here in our party. So they're bringing their alcohol in. They walk in. They said, what are you doing? I said, well, we're rejoicing. They said, what are you drinking? I said, we're drinking new wine. They said, we've never had new wine. I said, that's obvious. <laughs> See, if you don't have new wine, you end up speaking wine knees. <laughs> That's what girl, most Christians speak wine knees, you know? It's the wine knees thing, you know, and they're wine all the time. <laughs> That's why God gives you a new wine. Come on. So they came over and they said, well, can we can we have some of that stuff? I said, yeah, yeah, you can have it. They said, well, aren't you going to give us a glass? I said, we haven't served it in a glass. I said, how do you serve it? I said, well, we inject it into a sword. <coughs> and then we inject the sword. See, the Spirit, the Word of God is a sword. Yeah. I said, then we inject the sword into your heart. The eyes got real big. I said, that will kill you. I said, yep, it'll make you alive. <laughs> Come on, make you fully alive. <laughs> By that time, they realized we were church people, kind of cray cray, but church people. And they began opening up. They said, we're about ready to go to Afghanistan. We're, we're afraid. Will you pray for us? And I remember leading 50 young men to the Lord that day. Amen. But you know, none, none of them would have come over unless we made a joyful sound. It was a sound of rejoicing that got them. It was the sound of rejoicing. See, when the sound of rejoicing is actually heard outside, come on. When the sound of rejoicing is, is in the lips of the Christians, yeah. it will cause people to come from every direction. Because honestly, they don't, they don't care what we believe as much as what it does for us. I mean, there's certain people, you know... <laughs> When I first met a few Christians, I didn't know if I ever wanted to go to heaven. I said, are you going to be there? <laughs> I mean, there's, there's still a, a few. I said, God, can you put their mansion some way f far away from mine? <laughs> but in his presence is fullness of joy. In his presence. And I don't care what you go through. So I, I, you know, my wife will tell you. There have been times when she's opened up the office and we were we had all these bills to pay. And I could pay three or four of them. And they were usually the small ones. So I, I, I wrote the ones I could pay. And I was sitting on the office thing and my wife thought, are you going crazy? She opens the door, I'm laughing. I'm throwing the bills up in the air. I said, Lord, these are my bills. These are your bills. <laughs> I couldn't pay them. <laughs> and guess what? It worked. By the end of the, the week or the end of the month, everything was paid. Now, that doesn't mean you don't take responsibility other ways. I'm not saying be irresponsible, but guess what? You can only be responsible for what you can be responsible for. Put everything in God's hands and rejoice. Because he's wild about you. Amen. I love James 1 too. It says, count it all joy. Count it all joy. Count it all joy when you encounter various trials. See, that, that, that makes no sense to most people. Count it all joy when you're believing God for your healing and your kid gets sick. Sick. Count it all joy when you're believing God for five hundred dollars, not even a thousand or five thousand. It's funny, you know. I don't care where you are in your faith walk; you always need faith. 
And be honest with you, I used to believe God for $100. Now I believe God for several hundred thousand at a time. But guess what? It's the same deal as when it was $100. It's just the way it is. You always need faith. You know, I, used to, I heard Terry Savelle say something I, did. I was, wish he hadn't said, but it's true. He says, when your faith grows, God will make sure your needs grow so you always have to live by faith. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But the bottom line is count all joy. When you in James 1 2, knowing something, you can't count all joy if you don't know you're going to come out lacking nothing. See, if you don't believe you're going to win, you'll lose in the middle. Mm -hmm. But if you believe you're coming out the other side, no matter how long it takes, you'll count all joy to all the way through it. That's right. And to be honest, the more mature you are, the less people will know you're going through anything. Because you you don't change. You're all, you know people people are around me. They said I've been around you forty years. I've never seen you. You've always been the same. And you know they've seen me when everything was great. They've seen me in the natural when everything stunk, and no one can tell the difference. Come on, why? Because it's all in God's hands anyway. Yeah. But I love one of the translations I, I've always lived by is when everything goes wrong, throw a party. Mm -hmm. Not a pity party. That's right. Thank when you, I mean, when basically, when you basically hit a wall, party your way through it. You know, buy, buy a cake, get the blowers out. Because how many of you understand, if the devil gets your joy, he gets your goods. If he steals your joy, he steals your strength, he steals your future. And be honest, he can't steal your joy unless you let him have it. That's right. And joy is a choice. People always ask me, it's funny, how are you doing? I said, always good. And they all look at me, always good. I said, always good. I said, I made that choice 30 years ago. And sometimes I have to remind myself of the choice I made. God sets before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life. Always good. If you believe everything works together for your good, not everything is good, but everything will be turned for your good, it's always good. Come on, it's always going to be good. It's always going to end up being good because God's good. And when you believe in the goodness of God, it's hard to be stayed down. You know, I remember years ago, one of my friends went through the toughest church splits I've ever seen. And anyone who's pastor in church understands church splits. You know, but he went through one where they had 300 people, he had a congregation of 300 on Sunday morning, and 100, all 300 showed up that Sunday, but 150 what, in the middle of this preaching got up and started yelling at them. Screaming at them. Explaining why they're all leaving the church. Made a public display. So half the church walks out. Now families were split over this. Some family members stayed, some family members left. It was a small enough community where it's, it's huge news. The pastor said, well, I was scheduled to preach there next week. You know, I, I'm an overseer of the church. And he said, you come? And I said, I wouldn't miss this for anything. <laughs> Anyone knows me. I'm a fighter. I love to fight. Well, is, I, I do. I, honestly, I, it's really, I, it was just got me in trouble a lot. I was one of those things that, was, you know, if I couldn't fight my own fight, I'd find someone else's. But I'm a fighter by nature. But my doctor, my parents said, when the doctor slapped me, uh, you know, he slapped me, I slapped him back, made him cry. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew this was a fight, so we're coming. He said, what are we going to do? I said, let me pray about it. 
They had a trade about it. And I called them up. Pastor, I said, you're not going to like what I'm going to tell you. I said, I want you to buy. Because God said, what do you do every time everything goes wrong? He said, we buy a cake. We get the party hat on. We get the blowers. He said, then do it. So I called the pastor. I said, I want you to get the biggest cake you can get. I want you to have enough party hats for everybody. Go up. Now I want to make sure everyone has a blower and a party hat. No one's allowed in the sanctuary unless they have their hat on. And I want the cake. Normally there's no food in the sanctuary, but I want the cake behind me while I'm preaching. I knew the pastor thought, well, that's it. This is the last Sunday. Everyone else is going to leave. And I, I, have you ever walked into a place and all these adults have hats on? None of them want to be there. They're all thinking, my friends are right in leaving this place. And they're staring. I'll preach you. When everything goes wrong, throw a party. And I'm looking. If looks get killed, I'm dead. You know? It's worse than the little kids that are miserable at their parties. Because adults, they're like... That ain't even cute. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're staring at me and, and I'm preaching. I'm thinking, God, you told me to preach this. You told me. You told me I'm going to keep preaching. And this old guy, and probably the old guys are like my age now. Because that was like 20 years ago. <laughs> but the old guy got up. One of the old guys got, and he walks behind me. I thought he was going to hit me, but he walks right by me gets a big hunk, takes his hand, takes a big hunk of cake. Back in those days, I always preach with my glasses on. So he comes and shoves the cake in my face. Now I look like Mr. Magoo. <laughs> you know? So you know what I did after I took the glasses off so I could see? I went and got a big chunk of cake, pushed it in his face. Next thing you know, everybody's coming out of their seats from every direction. And they're grabbing hold of chunks of cake. And their food fight is on, baby. It is on in the sanctuary. And they're laughing. They're having the best time. It broke a spirit. It broke a spirit. Sometimes you have to break a spirit. Come on. And although we had to replace the carpet, so it was kind of expensive. <laughs> It was worth it because the next week, all these people that had left came back. Why? Because it was bro it was broken in the spirit. Sometimes people don't understand. They stay around having a pity party, a party with the pit, and they allow the spirit of heaviness just to stay around all the time. And we got to get rid of it. And you don't have to feel like getting rid of it. You make a choice. That's right. Everyone's brother Summerall met Smith Wigglesworth for the first time. And Smith was like Brother Summerall was in his 20s. Smith was 83. And he walks up and Brother Summerall knocks on the door and Smith was an intimidating man. And he looked at him and he said, he got so nervous, he didn't know what to say. So he said, Smith, how are you feeling? That set Smith Wigglesworth off. <laughs> he started saying, you asked Smith Wigglesworth how he feels? You are asking Smith Wigglesworth how he feels? Smith Wigglesworth doesn't even ask Smith Wigglesworth how he feels. Smith Wigglesworth tells Smith Wigglesworth how he feels. And what they said about Smith Wigglesworth, even up into his 80s, he would get out of bed in the morning and dance in the spirit with all his might for at least 10 minutes. Me? That ain't happening. I'm getting out of the bed in the morning. I'm going to find a coffee. After the coffee, I may tap my toes. But you know, there's something about taking authority over your emotions. Taking authority. Can 
casting down every thought. Does this make sense? See, I, I don't know about you, but I, it's our responsibility to be happy. I remember, you know, when I was at the University of Richmond, I had the big picture, but many of you have, have seen the picture, the big picture. Of I literally had all over the wall the laughing Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know? And my, my roommate was drunk. It's really funny because I hadn't met him yet. And my roommate walks in. He looks at the wall. <laughs> he was drunk already. He's a Jesus Christ. I said, at least you know who he is. <laughs> you know, but he was happy drunk. I actually liked him a lot. But you know, I had a friend come to the room, and you know, he would always come and, and visit with, with my roommate. And he knocks at the door one day, and I said, well, Bobby's not here. And he starts, the first thing he says is, I hate you. He said, I'm here to see you. He said, I hate you. I said, you hate me. That made me laugh. <laughs> I said, why do you hate me? He said, because you're too happy. <laughs> Nobody can be that happy. I hate you. <laughs> I said, you want to be happy? He said, boy, yeah, I did. <laughs> I said, let me introduce you to the one. Come on. So I got a chance to lead him to Christ, and he had a silly dream on the rest of the time I was there. <laughs> See, how many of you understand? Joy is contagious. Joy is contagious. How many of you, been, how many of you ever been tickled at something? It's really not that funny, but it tickled you. I mean, how, how many of you have ever been in a place where you're trying not to laugh? You tried everything, you, because it's not appropriate, but you're trying not to laugh. But it's just too bad. I don't know how many times I end up at the principal's office growing up. <laughs> and I don't know what triggered it. All I've done, I just, and once I got started, I wasn't stopping, baby. I wasn't stopping. They might as well send me down there. <laughs> you know? But see, I, I love people with a sense of humor. I really do. Well, one day we, we were, were at a U.S. Post Office, my wife was with my son, and they told me, and so Joey, this guy backs up into my wife, and you know, it's caused dents in the car inside where Joey was. He was a little kid at the time. So the guy comes over, and he's really, he's almost in shell shock to see if Joey's all right. They roll down the window, Joe, right out of Joey's mouth, he said, hey, buddy! What you doing? Practicing for the demolition derby? <laughs> <laughs> some of you, some of you, you know, how many of you know there are things in life you're going to say, I'm going to laugh about this someday. I might as well start now. <laughs> this is going to be really funny when I tell it. It wasn't fun at the time, but it's going to be funny when I tell it. How many of you have really done stupid, stupid things in your life? I think one of the stupidest one is, is changing the wrong tire. <laughs> in a rainstorm, a major rainstorm. I, <laughs> I'm already, you know, kind of I'm soaked. And we cha I changed my wife's in the car, that's been made it worse. <laughs> So, I mean, we're, we're, I, I, you know, I changed the tires and said, okay, we're only about two miles away. Should they all make it down? Fun, fun, fun. So I had to stop and look and open it. There it was, the wrong tire. <laughs> I've lived on that one. <laughs> I lived on the one where I was supposed to go from Tulsa to Arkansas. Two hours. And somehow I ended up in Houston. <laughs> And I had a busload of teenagers. <laughs> so they started calling me wrong way, Woody. 
or the time they put me up in a bed and breakfast. And it was one of those Holy Ghost nights, and uh, we didn't get out of service until after midnight. We couldn't, nobody could move. So the pastor said, well, you want me to drive? I said, no, I'm wired, even though I'm tired. So I'm going to walk. So I remember, it was like half a mile or less than half a mile. I go, I go into this house. It's after midnight. There's an old couple on the couch. <laughs> hey, I'm looking at them and said, I'm going to my room now. They just stared at me. <laughs> I got about halfway up the stairway and realized it was the wrong house. <laughs> so I walked back down and said, see you later. <laughs> Final thing, then we're going to pray for people. This okay? Yes. It better be. It's what I got. But Psalm 51, verse 7. It says, purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from young. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my iniquities. Create me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy. Restore the joy. That's what God needs. I mean, I can't see some people need to get the joy back. Mm -hmm. See, the problem is people are doing things for the wrong reason. When duty takes the place of love, joy is quenched. So you're going through the motions, you're doing all the right things, but for the wrong reason, you're not connected in relationships, so you have no joy in it. Come on. But restore to me the joy of my salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors the way. And sinners will be converted. Then, 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 after the joy is restored, then they'll listen. They're not listening till the joy is there. They're not listening. Last thing, and, and I promise, because many of you have had too much turkey. <laughs> you look like the stuffed bird yourself. But anyway, you know, Years ago, when I was preaching in Alaska, and I'll never forget that trip because it was the coldest winter on record. And he's mentioned Alaska, that's saying something. And I was going to a place called Bethel, Alaska. You can't get to Bethel, Alaska, but by small plane. And you, you go in the middle of winter, you usually have a two seated plane and you land on the ice. It's fine, cool. And all the Inuits love me, all the drunk es Eskimos especially. Drunk Eskimos love Woody. <laughs> they do, man. They, they come to my meetings, they always, they always come with their bottles in and, and they leave them at the altar as an offering. And <laughs> come back the next night with fresh bottles sometimes. But still, you know, I remember when I was going out there, this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said, he said, I want you to deal with the problem of incest and sexual abuse. When I was going out there, the public schools shut down the schools to bring all their students to my meetings. So literally, here I am holding meetings and all the school kids are at the meetings. And I'm dealing with incest and sexual abuse. And this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said, until they feel clean, they'll never truly be happy. And see, the blood of Jesus wipes away, wipes you as clean as snow. See, many people live in regret many times for what they've done or what was done to them. Either way, it will block the joy. You must never forget you must never regret what God's chosen to forget. So I remember dealing with that. It was a pretty serious message in a sense, but it released your tremendous joy. And when I gave the altar call, what surprised me was not the teenage girls and some of the guys that came forward. I knew, I knew what the culture was. 
What surprised me when I gave the altar call were four 80-year-old ladies in the back. And as soon as I gave that altar call, they became the gut-wrenching screams. And I knew that there were unclean spirits. And there was nothing that they had done. It was something that was done to them. But it was stifling them. So when they all came forward, I gave a little teaching again on the blood, because the blood makes you white snow. The blood is powerful. The blood restores purity. Restores purity. Most Christians I know because of their past still feel second rate. And that's because they don't understand the power of the blood. They have trouble receiving because they don't receive and understand the power of the blood. Now they have trouble being happy. Be honestly, until, until, you're, until you can love yourself, you're going to have a miserable life. God loves you. And I, you know, when I first got saved, God loved me, I loved God. I just didn't love me. It took me for a long time to get my opinion in the same place as God's opinion. Now God was wild about me even though I wasn't perfect in performance. I was the apple of his eye. And when I began to love me, I began to love life. Because I'm always with me. Does this make sense? And when I began to get, do this with these old, old ladies, when I led them all in the prayer, what I saw is their countenance change. I saw joy, true, true joy. And you know what they told me? They said, you know, what do you... They all were related. They said we all were abused by the same family member. As little kids. They said here we've been born again and in church since we were seven years old. And yet we never felt to clean the day of our life until now. Never felt clean. Come let's restore the clean. Not because of anything we've done. Not even because we're perfect in performance. Our performance doesn't make us clean. His blood makes us clean. In fact, if we walk in the light, he's in the light, the blood will continuously cleanse us from all sin, all sin and all unrighteousness. So there's a cleansing going on. But how many of you tonight, I'm here right now, I want, I want a happy church. I want a happy church. You know what I'm saying? I want a happy church. And it's a choice. It's more of a choice than it is anything else. It really is. I choose to be happy. It's my choice. Now, God, God chooses for me to be happy, but he doesn't force his happiness on me. He said, you can be miserable even though I gave you all the joy you want. But you can choose to be miserable. You can sh choose to feel like a victim. You can choose to wallow on self-pity. Or you can get an oil change. Come on. How many of you tonight, you want an oil change? I want to pray for people tonight. I want to pray for some fresh oil to flow tonight. I want to pray if you need a healing in your body. I believe in God for your miracle tonight. Come on. You want, you want to see joy? You should see that young man that came back. He, he had a death sentence. Now he has a life sentence. Long life sentence. Come on. That's happy. Some of you, God wants to give you fresh oil. He wants to give you fresh anointing oil. Some of you need to you know, report for duty, sir. It's this nation needs you. And everywhere you go, don't, don't wait for people to come to church. Let the church go to them. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it's a restaurant, whether it's in Walmart, whether it's in, in the parking lot. Yeah. The day of us waiting around, it ain't working. So take the good news. God wants to anoint you with fresh oil. 
So if, that, if you want prayer, I want to pray for you real quick. Come on. Come on. I know there's some people. Come on. Come on. Drink yourself happy. <laughs> Drink yourself happy. <laughs> yeah, you can. We're just going to begin to lift your hands towards heaven. Because God is about ready to birth something. Come on. There is an oil change going on. Some of you right now, you, you know, you, you're you on fine. Everything's going to lighten up. It's going to lighten up. God's got it. God's got us. There's fresh joy, unspeakable, full of glory. This is your season now. Uh, you might as well receive your miracle now. You might as well receive fresh oil all over you. It's getting fun right there, right there, right there, right there, right there, right there. Right there. <laughs> Some of you going to wake up giggling. God likes to tickle his kids. <laughs> you know, I, when I get around the little ones, I love tickling them. They love for me to tickle them. Because it begins to strengthen, 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 strengthen. That joy is your strength. This is a new season. Everything's becoming fresh. Everything's becoming new.